It is a pleasure to be here and uh, I was mentioning to a young lady that's here with me at the booth, uh, Hannah, as we got in here about a uh, half hour ago, you know, we wondered if this room would fill up. Indeed it did and it certainly it's uh, very full and it's exciting to see all of you come together and as always it's just a, really a testament to you that you're investing your time uh, to contribute to your business and to your industry. and, and um, uh, certainly, as we go forward and, and deal with this today, it is a challenge. Uh, I guess when I signed up to do this, right, and I was asked to come speak for lunch about the market, um, that seemed to be a pretty easy task and, and uh, an easy duty. Just the conversation we had here at lunch, it's not so easy. It's been very challenging and it's very real. Uh, certainly a different story than where we were last year. Uh, and um, so we, we have some challenges ahead of us, but let's, uh, you know, we'll talk about the market, where we've been, talk about where we're going in 2016 and some of the things that I see happening and what I believe are important. Uh, and, and then also to talk a little bit about some strategies to deal with that and, and maybe how we approach this in a little different way than traditionally we have before. Um, because it is, it is a very difficult and challenging time and probably yesterday was, uh, as, as I've mentioned several times here this morning, a little bit of salt in the wound, if you will. Now certainly we've recovered some this afternoon, but um, we're uh, today, but uh, still nonetheless the challenges are very real. Let's look back at, at 2015, we'll get into 2016, and as I was explaining, we're going to talk about some strategies then maybe to deal with some of those. So almost a three-part session here as we go forward, and certainly mindful of time and want to leave some time for questions, uh, but uh, going forward. Interestingly enough, uh, it was just about a year ago, I did a presentation for the Kentucky Cattlemen's Association, and they wanted me to do an outlook in 2015. And, that was about the middle of January, and, and this was one of my slides. And this is the highlights that I included in January, you know, press releases and news coverage. Right? Let's all think back to where we were a year ago. Man, the world felt good, didn't it? It was great. The market was working in our favor. Everything felt good, and we just almost talked ourselves into the fact that nothing could go wrong. I mean, here you go, you look at these, land prices peaking, cattle still on the rise. I mean, it's all those kinds of things. I think if we look back today, we'd, we'd probably go, well, land prices are no longer peaking, and cattle, whatever words you want to put in there, sure aren't on the rise, right? But it's amazing how fast that happened. And, and I've done a couple of radio interviews already this morning, and I'll talk about this in more detail, Volatility really is the key, and there's lots of uncertainty, but we didn't foresee this. I don't think anyone, anyone who tells you, yeah, we knew this was going to happen, you know, stay away from them, right? That's, that's a little bit scary because I don't think anybody saw that to this degree. Now, we also know kind of in our back pocket, those of us that have a little bit of gray hair or no hair or whatever, however you want to say that, because uh, both are true, um, we also know how tough and challenging commodity markets are. And oh, they can beat you up any day of the week, and, and that's where we are. And so um, we, we also recognize that. So here's the reality. This is what we've been dealing with. Um, you know, this is fed cattle. Live cattle bottomed out in December 09, right at the peak of the financial crisis. We traded sub 80 right in the middle of December of 09, 79.80, for those of you that remember. Um, and we worked our way up for about five years and, you know, we just kept chopping higher and higher and higher. And, it, it, uh, you know, I think one of the key things, the markets went higher. The other thing that we know about this business is that we had more and more capital at risk all the time, right? And so that's been the challenge. And we ultimately peaked out at 171 last year, just about a year ago. We came back and got awful close again in April. If you remember, we traded cattle in 160 plus in there, 165. And, um, you know, we doubled 
the value of live cattle in, in about five years. That's unprecedented. It's also why you had to keep going back to your bank and asking for more money. Yes, I'm selling them for, but my costs have gone up proportionally. Um, you know, we're back now. We traded cattle at 123, 124 last week, and, and you know, those are prices we haven't seen since 2012. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll see what this week brings. Every week's a new week. Uh, but, um, you know, we're, we're testing that, and, and I think we're testing a, certainly a very key support level at 120. Um, we did break through there right at the first week of October, end of September uh, at 117. But, um, you know, we are in that testing some very key support levels as, as we go forward here in the next couple of weeks. And so all those good news stories, those forecasts that we saw in the press and, and the prognosticators, um, you know, what prices were going to be in 2015, it, it certainly didn't uh, turn out that way. And this is a little bit sometimes how you feel. And I think this is, um, you, you know, it's, it's on one hand kind of funny, but on the other hand, it isn't. Because there, there has been some very serious equity drain out of this business, and that's a financial side there's also an emotional side to this. These markets can beat you up, and uh, it can be just sometimes downright depressing and very challenging. And, and um, you, you know, I, I likened it, I wrote an article a month ago, it's sort of uh, being in the Ardennes forest where the artillery just keeps pummeling you week after week, and, and you just don't, sometimes don't know what to do. And it's, it, it moves very quickly. And so, indeed, it didn't turn out that way. And why not? Well, I, I think, you know, ultimately people always ask you, where, where's the market going to go? And we're going to talk about that in a little more detail later, right? And I always say, well, the market's going to go where the cutout goes, right? Ultimately, we work in a consumer-driven business, and the value of meat is what drives this market. And now we'll get some variance around that, and obviously we've gotten some variance here this fall, especially as we've gotten uncurrent. These cattle have gotten big. Feed yards have lost their leverage. Um, it doesn't follow it quite as well as maybe it should. And then when we were current, we forget a couple of years ago, we'd outrun the cutout. But ultimately, we follow the cutout, and this is what's happened. You remember that we came up and we touched a 260, 265, and, and we chopped along there pretty nicely. And you know, I remember when we broke through 200, we thought, wow, okay. Well, we've given up all of that. And so now we're back there flirting with a choice cut out at 200. The select broke below there last week. And that's the challenge here. And um, so ultimately, where this goes, right, you want to follow the signals, you follow the cutout. And, okay. and that's uh, ultimately what we need to deal with as we go forward and that's that's been the driver so why why is the cutout giving up so much value here and, and, and it gets a little more complicated than that and we'll talk about that also but one of the things that's been most challenging of late is that we continue to build not just cattle inventory which we'll talk about but beef in inventory the beef that is going into cold storage continues to mount. In, in the most recent USD report, right at the end of October, uh, so the report comes out in November and, you know, we'll be coming up here on the November storage pretty quickly, but October was 512 billion pounds. That's the largest October on record. And that's essentially a week's worth of kill, if you will. And what's important is you'll see that we really bottomed out in July of 14, and that's just been slowly growing, slowly growing. Now, the mix of that's very important, and a lot of people will tell you we've got a lot of lean trimmings in there, um, but, but that's important, right? We're not replacing that with our own domestic lean trimmings. A lot of that's been imported. We're putting it in freezers. That's fine, but nonetheless, that's a big cushion buffer that we have to work through ultimately. So in other words, beef supplies are not current and that ultimately is going to keep a limit on prices somewhat as we go forward and that's a very important factor that we need to continue to watch especially as we start talking about record levels so the other thing that's important here that we sort of forget or we don't talk about enough in our business and it's been the chop in in terms of the international market and in 
as I think probably all of you are aware, the dollar is strong, continues to get stronger. We've seen lots of this shift in, in oil prices, and that's been favorable for us as consumers. That's favorable for a dollar, but in terms of exporting, it's not favorable, right? We like a weak dollar, and we work in a business, in an industry, whether it's in, in grains or whether it's in meat production, we are net exporters, or mostly, um, we typically tend to be the only industry in the United States that has a positive trade balance, and we've been fighting that battle. As the dollar gets stronger, our products are less attractive overseas, and that's true again on the grain side or on the meat side. And ultimately, we've seen that, that, you know, we have seen exports go down and work their way down. It becomes more and more challenging to deal with, and ultimately on the other side of that, what do we do? We import more product. We're bringing in more lean trimmings than we have in quite some time because they're relatively cheap and therefore we don't slaughter as many cows and we make those into, we mix those with 50-50 trim to make that into hamburger. But this has been a real challenge. One of the things that really helped us from 2010 and 11, 12, 13 and into 14 was the, our exports. And we were able to garner a lot of extra value. That's more challenging for us. And um, the, we'll continue to be as we continue to see strength in the dollar. And who would have ever thought, you know, we're probably isolated here in agriculture to talk about that. You know, who would have ever thought we don't want a strong dollar? But we see that. And it's the same theme we're seeing in many of these larger uh, multinational companies that do manufacturing their earnings are being challenged by a strong dollar because they can't ship their products and whatever that is, you know, a Caterpillar bulldozer or what have you, it's the same story as we talk about that. So it's kind of the big macro picture. What I want to do is bring that back home. What does that mean ultimately to us in terms of the production sector? Um, many of you can probably tell me much better than I can tell you, but I can tell you what the data says out there um, as we talk about that. These are net returns, and this is some data that's put together by uh, the Kansas State University. I think they do a really nice job in terms of some of their data sets to work with, and I like this. Now, recognize these are cash-to-cash -cash returns, okay? So there's no accounting in here. It's impossible for risk management or whatever strategies, but if you're just looking at a cash-to-cash, -cash, you're buying a 750-pound yearling and shipping him out at 1350 Remember, we used to talk about 1250, and we'll talk about that in just a second. These are your losses, okay? We, we made some money last year, but now all of a sudden you get into 2015, we are draining a ton of equity out of this business, and many of you are experiencing that firsthand. That's the challenge. Who would have ever thought we'd be talking about cattle going out at $500 a head? And that's, that's real. You know, you can say that's the data and what's wrong with the data. I can tell you that I was in South Texas um, at a, a yearling operator, you know, who's sitting on about 3,500 head in, in the end of September and told me that very thing. He's upside down $500 a head, okay? So that's, that's real. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about the feeder market, but this is the very thing we talked about at lunch here at our table. The buy right now still doesn't allow you a lot of opportunity to make money going forward. We still haven't been able to turn this thing completely around as, as we go forward. So this is one of the things that, that I like to look at and kind of, to me, it tells the story. Um, many companies often look at their inventory investment and what's their gross margin return on that. It's a pretty key financial measure. And, and really, we can do the same thing with feeder cattle. What's, what's our total investment? And then what's the gross profit? Gross margin or gross profit is, is revenue minus cost of goods sold. Well, what you sell a, a fed steer for minus a feeder steer, and you begin to compare those differences. And if you look what happened as we got into uh, 2015, and, and by the way, the, the uh, trend lines are six-month trend lines, okay? So it's basically a turn of cattle. Look what happened. As we got into April and May, that's that blue line at the bottom. Boy, it just plummeted. And that's where our losses started to get tough. And because they were priced right against 
those feeder cattle that we had bought in the previous fall that were so expensive. And so we really got double whammied. And to me, the best analogy that I like to use is that the cattle feeding sector hit the financial crisis much like we did with consumers in, in 2008 and 9. Remember, they were all buying those houses at high prices and then all of a sudden the bottom fell out. It's the same thing. And so as those two lines diverge, that's what begins to tell you how tough it is. Now they've converged some, but they're way away from kind of the historical inventory margin that we typically allow ourselves in this business. And so we still have a ways to go. And you're gonna hear me say that a couple of more times uh, as we go forward. So what's interesting in, in um, how, how are we responding as an industry? Well, we're all fighting the market. I don't care if you're a seller or a buyer, you've been fighting the market for pretty much a year now because you've been frustrated by this. And you know whether you kind of knowingly have done it or not, you have. And year to date, we are down almost a million head in terms of placements into feed yards over a thousand head capacity, okay? Now what's interesting is every single month in the lighter three categories, so less than 600 pounds, six to seven, seven to eight, placements are down. Cattle over 800 pounds, placements are up. So while we're down a million head, that's all been in those lighter three categories, the placements in heavy cattle are up, and that is true through October. That's been true every single month. So what are we doing? We're leaving cattle out on pasture longer. Okay, so, so either cow-calf producers or stalkers are, are hanging on to them, hoping the market's going to turn. And if you're a feed yard operator, you said, I don't want those lighter weight cattle. I'm going to continue to bring in heavy cattle, and I'm going to keep those out there because I'm fighting the market too. And what's the old adage? What do we know? Heavy in, heavy out. Heavy in, heavy out. And we also know corn's cheap. I don't need to tell any of you about that in here, do I? And so what do we do? We feed them that much longer, and this is what we've seen. Carcass weights just continue to go up and up and up, and, and you know, we're, we're about to peak, and I've heard, I've read lots of stuff, you know, the peak should be over. We've cleaned up all the front end. We've got all the heavy cattle gone. Mm, you know, we, we still have uh, carcass weights last week, 935 steer carcass weights, okay? We're, our last week, last week, our harvest weights were 1393. Okay, we're down a couple of pounds. Heavy in, heavy out. And so the story being, while the meat supply is, is growing, so is this front end supply. And these cattle over 120 days, 3.6 million head last year, I mean last month, excuse me. And so we continue to fight the market. Cattle get big, we're uncurrent. We deal with that and we lose our leverage. And so this has been an ongoing theme, heavy in, heavy out, heavy in, heavy out. We've got lots of feeder cattle out there on grass. They're getting bigger. We're gonna continue to see that trend through the spring and, and probably through May at least. So with that, heavy in, heavy out, lots of cattle sitting out there, lots of losses. Fed cattle market gives up a lot of money. We're, we're going to translate that right back into the feeder cattle market, and that's exactly what we've seen. And last week, the Friday CME feeder cattle index traded at 165. Um, that's about as low as we've seen since uh, late 2013, early 2014. Um, and so, again, though, we saw an incredible run. But just think how far we've come off of where we were just a year ago. We've taken nearly $80.00 out of the yearling market. Okay, we were at 240, 245 last October. Now we're trading at 165 and you can do the math and then you start multiplying that over a truckload. That's a lot of money. Okay, so that's where we are in terms of the, cat, the feeder cattle index. And obviously that then be, begins to translate back into calf prices. So that's the story. Boy, you can just feel it like, oh, right? I, I did these a year ago, it's a lot more fun. Okay, that's the reality. So where do we go with 2016? Okay, 
Um, I think that's important. What's next? Because we all understand that, but I think it's important we get some context of where we've been. Uh, where, where do we go with all of that? Okay. I think there's several themes, lots of things converging as we go forward here. Um, I, I, you know, we've been dealing with the Federal Reserve now since 2008, 2009. We'll see if we're going to raise interest rates, but monetary policy is going to be huge. And what happens not just here in the United States, but then relative to other economies and how our dollar is, is valued in, in, in the foreign marketplace. It's, it's, it's really important. So it's not important, it's not just important to watch the U.S. Federal Reserve and the central banking here, but it's also what goes on in Europe and China. Uh, I'm, I'm concerned about Russia, those types of things, but it's very important because that's going to affect us. Simultaneously, that's monetary policy, fiscal policy. We're going to have a new Congress. What do we deal with our debt and what have you? And all of those things begin to converge in terms of the dollar. Consumer confidence, and I want to talk about that in a little more detail. Quality, beef quality, such a huge issue. And, and, and I think is the great story that's left to tell here in our industry. And I'll talk to you about that. Trade, that's obviously directly related to monetary and physical policy and the value of the dollar, foreign exchange, what have you. The profit relationship. I think it's important. I want to talk about that. Volatility rules a day. We'll talk about that. Consolidation, alignment, and expansion. I think that's the really the key question. How far do we expand and what, what does this do to us? So with that, just a quick glance at um, what, what happens with consumers. This is consumer sentiment uh, that gets updated every month uh, by the University of Michigan. You know, we, we peaked out here earlier in the year. It's kind of been eroding away just from the last couple of four or five months. Um, it's interesting, even in, in cheaper gas prices. And uh, by the way, I paid $1.66 for gas last week in Houston. You would think we'd all be having a party, but I'm not sure it still feels good. I think, you know, it's interesting. Those of us that have a little more age than others, I think we all grew up believing that we were going to run out of oil at some point. And it's hard for us to get over that. And you know what? It's a new day. The United States isn't going to run out of oil, but I'm still not sure we believe it as consumers. And um, any, anyway, we continue to have headwinds against the economy, and that, that's certainly important in, in terms of how do consumers just feel, right? Because we spend based upon how we feel, and, and that's important. So with that in mind, this is a busy graph, I know, but it's, to me, one of the most important ones here because I think it's the story for us. And so as ugly as this can get sometimes and as it feels, this is the key take home and it's the important story that we tell here, okay? So this is market share by sales, select product versus prime and branded, okay? And if you go back to 2010, Prime and Branded represented about 12 or 13 percent of weekly sales. And that's dollars. So I'm not measuring pounds. This is total dollars. And Select was about 20 percent. And you can see over the last few years, Prime and Branded has continued to increase. Now, recognize that has happened against the backdrop of the financial crisis kind of latching at our heels all the time, just biting at us, and we're dealing with these issues, and meanwhile, select has gone down. Now, some of you might say, well, sure, because we're producing more prime and choice product. I mean, right, it's about 75% of the product. You know what's interesting? The premiums have stayed the same. That's counterintuitive. As you get bigger supply, the value of those should go down. It hasn't. Our customers are still wanting this. And what's interesting, January 2015, for the first time, prime and branded sales, total dollars generated, generated every single week, surpassed select. And now look at it. Prime and branded sales, top end of the market, now represents about one in every five dollars coming into this business. Select is down to less than 15. Consumers are telling us they like beef, and they like a high quality product. And that's something we need to respond to and we have responded to that. 
And to me, this is the great success story. And this is ultimately, for me, what buffers us against playing that commodity churn over a long term. Well, yesterday's news was big. With the WTO uh, allowing Canada and Mexico uh, billion dollars in terms of tariffs, just to give you some perspective, and that really was a big drag on the futures yesterday. Um, we export about a billion, $1.03 billion to Canada, $1.07 billion to Mexico last year. Uh, beef will certainly be in the mix of those tariffs. And, um, you know, Canada and Mexico have represented a very important export market for us, and that's going to be somewhat of a challenge. And so we talk about domestic, domestic market and domestic demand, this international demand is going to be a very important issue and I'm not trying to get into the politics of country of origin labeling here whatsoever just want to share the facts and that we keep that mindful as we go forward in 2016 so where does that leave us well yesterday uh, we're a little better off today I had to update my um, uh, slides this morning this is actually of December 7th not December 4th I had to update it um, as of yesterday we were trading near uh, lifetime lows and all the contracts established new lifetime lows yesterday but that's that's where we are but now recognize that that contract was as much as 160 for December we're now down closer to 120 so obviously we've given up quite a bit of value there but that's just important to give you some perspective and, and you know if you want to look out at 2016 where are we going well I don't think anybody has the perfect answer but that's what the board's telling you that in other words that's much like the yield curve Okay, we're, we're trading sideways 120, what have you. Now, obviously, those things can move up. We know that, but that's what the board's telling us right now. Um, and, and let's hope that we don't uh, break through that 120 level. Now, this is what's interesting to me. This is the conversation we just had at lunch about the break-evens, okay? 2014 was an incredible year, right, if you sold feeder cattle. Whew, it felt good every week, didn't it? And if you price what you paid for feeder cattle against the deferred future, so five months out at the time of purchase, you had a pretty nice regression line right there. And 2014 was very lucrative. Now look at 2015. In every situation, every deferred futures level, we've actually paid more for feeder cattle than we did in 2014. And that's true through the last week of November. So at the same value, we're still paying more for feeder cattle. We're still chasing them somehow, some way. Not as many, and they're bigger, but we're chasing them a little bit. At some point, that's going to have to change. That's the challenge. Even cattle bought today, as much as the feeder cattle market has broken, the cattle placed on feed today are still a challenge. Okay, that's important. I think this is very important as we talk about the feeder market. Where do we go? This relationship here is one of those keys we need to look forward to. Now, I, I've had some communication with some of my colleagues. They don't like this slide, but I think it's important. Now, I recognize that a cow-calf operation is very different than a feed yard operation and how they're financed and how they're managed and what have you. Okay. But what I did is I took the LMIC, Livestock Marketing Information Center, took the returns, inventory returns, so dollars per head. Now I multiplied that by two for a feed yard, and then I took a cow-calf operation times one, right? You basically turn two head of cattle out of a feed yard, you're gonna turn them twice, and then obviously you're gonna sell one cow has a calf, you sell it once a year, you get that, okay? And I compared them historically. What's, what's the difference between those? And you can see that that was pretty consistent over time through the 80s into 2000, mid 2000s, it began to creep up, which makes sense as supply got tight. But then as you look up into 2012, 2013, 2014, it spiked. Cow-calf operators were making far more historically per inventory than feedlots. Now again, I understand those are not perfect comparisons. I'm not trying to compare them. I'm just trying to show you historically, look what happened to us as a business. We got out of whack. And historically, our business 
doesn't like that. There will have to be at some point or likely be a regression to the mean back towards some normality where one segment isn't disproportionately leveraging against another. I think this is a very important contributor as we talk about what goes on in the feeder cattle market going forward. And I think we're seeing some of that. That's the pressure here, same as the live cattle. We're, we're seeing these contracts down near lifetime lows. We're trading there and probably will continue to see some pressure here. Um, obviously, as we try to give some money back to the cattle feeding sector. Now, I know cow-calf operators don't like to hear that, but that's probably ultimately what's going to happen as we continue to fight the market. And then I think the big question as you take all of that and put it together is where do we go with expansion? I mean, we probably, we're going to see expansion in, in 2016 versus 2015. Um, the, the question is how much do we expand or do we put the brakes on? Uh, depends on who you talk to. My guess is probably we're going to put the brakes on somewhat. I don't think we're going to be quite as aggressive as we thought we were just two or three years ago, right? Because it doesn't feel as good and it's, it's a very real concern and it's a different environment as, as we go forward into 2016. So with that in mind, I think a couple of key thoughts here. Um, you know, volatility rules the day. That's the key here, right? I've said that. Uh, to me, the market feels much like 2004. We're trying to figure out where we are. There's some new dynamics in terms of demand. There's some new dynamics in terms of supply. And what happens in those is that you bounce all around and we get lots of volatility and that's exactly what's happening. It's exactly what we're witnessing. And the other thing too is we're, we're seeing some unwinding of positions over in the futures contracts. Typically, we have been able to enjoy as if we're sellers, um, a lot of non-commercial long interests. Non-commercials are speculators. They've been historically long and, and bought the market. They have been unwinding. And as they unwind, it provides less hedging opportunities for sellers, the commercial interest, and that's exactly what's happened here. In fact, those lines have crossed. And so where the non-commercials, the speculators are now short the market. So the pressure's gonna stay on. And the commercials are now long the market. So we've reversed that. That doesn't happen very often. That's typically not what happens in most commodity markets. But you can see that big unwinding and that's contributing to part of the noise, the intraday noise that we get going on in the market. And here's where we are. LEZ5 is the December live cattle for 2015. Um, this is the last two months, and I mean, we have seen some huge intraday swings, right? I mean, we'll be up $2 and then we'll close the limit down, or we'll be down the limit and then close up a dollar and, and what have you. And it, it just almost can make you, you know, make your head spin from hour to hour is what goes on. And it's very challenging to make decisions in here as, as we go forward. I think the biggest thing is if you talk about volatility in terms of the Fed market um, in, in total dollars, because this is what really brings it home, is a 13-week moving average, you know, dollars per head, what's the volatility, how much does the market change from week to week? And I think part of what happened in 2014 is we got lulled to sleep a little bit. Market wasn't moving quite as fast as it does now. And then when it did move, it was to the upside. So it was okay. Now all of a sudden, here we are, and we're getting as much as 60, $65 per head weekly swings. That is huge. And you start multiplying that out on a truckload, how much more these cattle are worth this week versus last week or less this week than last week. It's hard to make decisions. That's real money, right? And so one of the things I always try to tell my students, okay, $60 per head, they go, yeah, 60 bucks, you know, it's a gas tank full of gas for my truck, whatever. I said, start multiplying that out. That's a lot of money. That's serious finance. And that's what makes this decision making hard. Volatility is, is ruling today and won't go away. So with that, I just want to close with a couple of thoughts as we manage this and go forward because I think it's really important, right? And, and volatility, you know, it, it doesn't, don't assume that you're the one that's going to benefit from it. What I like is um, I, I really appreciate the Chinese symbol for risk because it's double-sided. Typically, we talk about risk as per, need, uh, risk protection, is that we want to protect against the downside. But, you know, there's also this opportunity of missing out on the upside. 
And, and that can be risk. And we saw a lot of that in 2014. Oh, I missed out. I missed out. I missed out. But, but both sides are equally important as we talk about risk and whether you're managing fear or greed around volatility. And with that, I, I, I think it's just important to remember that this is a really complex business anymore. As we talk about the traders and what goes on, you've got all these external events, you've got external investors, you've got foreign currency, you've got you know, money flow happening. And I think the best testament to that and the new, new kind of dynamics that we work in and why we get this noise was an article that I snapped and it's, it's five years old now, four or five years old, but it was an article that said, IPAC factor spurs markets, grains included. You know what? That doesn't, that doesn't make any sense. Well, iPad factors, iPads, sales had gone very well in China. New report out on, you know, whatever, Tuesday morning. And what happens? External investors. The world's good. So it's a risk on day. So we're going to invest. We're going to invest in commodities because everything's happening that's positive. Now what happens? It also happens the other way. Okay? And I think, to me, that's the, that's the indicator of, of complexity. And then it's the speed. Because of the internet, what happens? Now, some of you are asking, what, what does Dustin Johnson have to do with anything? Well, some of you, anybody here a golf fan? I, I'm not. But I happen to be watching the PGA Championship on 2010 when Dustin Johnson, young kid, about to win it all, okay, make some bonehead move. Now, I hardly know the rules of golf. I don't understand it, okay? Whatever, I watched it. Don't ask me why I was watching on that Sunday afternoon, but I was. And he said, well, what does that mean? Well, interestingly enough, we had hired at the university when I was there a new provost, and he was brand new. And two days later, I was at a gathering much like this where he was going to speak publicly for the first time. And this guy was the ultimate nerd, okay? And he was much like me. Well, not, I hope I didn't just call myself a nerd, <laughs> but happened to be watching this. Only he was smart enough to understand that this was happening in real time, and he got on Wikipedia and watched how long it took for somebody to update Dustin Johnson's profile on Wikipedia. And he's nerdy enough, he counted it. 17 seconds. That's the speed with which we trade. That's what's going on. That's the challenge. That's the volatility. And then we've got these black swan events. Those are real. They're out there, right? And, and um, I, I uh, work pretty closely. I have a good friend who's a banker, very large corporate, who oversees ag risk portfolio. This is one of the things that keeps him up at night, given the size of his portfolio. What if? What if? What if? Okay? We get markets to break 25%. Ah, they can't break anymore. Nope. Always worried about the black swan event. We've got to protect against that. And so I always want to encourage producers, right? And so how do we make decisions against all of that? Well, you can't control any of that, and that's what's frustrating in our business, right? There are things we can control, but the things that we can begin to worry about is, is locking in margins. So we buffer ourselves against that. We refinance long-term debt. We pay down debt. Working capital reserve, okay? So you got enough money sitting out there that if something happens, you, you run the pickup into the tractor, and now you got to go buy a pickup. You don't have to go borrow money. You've, you've got that. You can handle that, and it doesn't affect the flow of your operation. Expansion. Is it a cash trap? Are, are you going to get tied into something you can't get back out of in the cost? Got to manage our costs. I just wrote an article about that for Feedstuff. So important because it's what helps buffer you against all of this. So... What, do you, what can we not do in 2016? As we talk about this, the hardest thing of all is to get emotion wrapped up with money, right? Remember, I had that picture earlier of, of the guy under his desk? Well, 
emotion was driving it. It's, this is the hardest thing to do because we live and breathe and eat this every day. It's hard not to get involved emotionally. And I talked to you about the guy, the, the stalker operator, who was upside down, $500 ahead. For him that day I was there, I could feel it. It was palpable. It was emotional. Uh, um, it reminded me of myself when I was 17 and my girlfriend broke up with me, right? I mean, it's, it's, that, it's that same feel. And, it, and it's, I, I mean, I'm kind of joking about it, but it was real. He was depressed. And it's, it's hard not to be. But so, you know, ultimately, and I end my monthly column every single month, and it, it, it's all about more and more. We've got to invest time into getting resources that help us in terms of decision making, objective information, and that is as important as what you do outside. The inside work you do, getting information, it is not a waste of time. And if I could always, if I can encourage producers, don't, don't worry about the race to get out and feed the cows, okay? I, I worked for a father-in-law like that. <laughs> Doesn't, it, it matters maybe, but not as much as getting information because there, there's real dollars. There's more capital at risk than ever. So it's, it's really important. And so as we put this in perspective as we go forward, right, I, the question is, okay, what's the market going to be? Well, it's going to be choppy and it's going to be probably noisy as we go forward, okay? But one thing you don't want to be is a price taker. So maybe that's the wrong question. The right question is really what's the business environment telling us? Because we don't want to get juked out like the duck hunter here, right? Okay? And then you get shot. And ultimately, what you need to ask, and it's different for every single person at every table in here, how do you make decisions around the signals the business is telling you? What is the business telling you, and then how do you make that? Because everyone has a different risk profile in here. So those decisions are going to be different. And then I think ultimately the question is, is what 2015 tells us is, what are the new opportunities? Where do they lie? So just uh, real quick to summarize, and, and I'll give you the, the 30 second spiel, is, is that's partly what we're trying to do at AgriClear, is we're trying to, we're bringing a new marketplace. And it's, it's a web platform that allows buyers and sellers of cattle to come together. They can transact and you have payment assurance and deal certainty. Um, you know, we were, we we're trying to empower producers to not be market takers, but ultimately market makers and, and have some cost savings and have access to an expanded marketplace and, um, you know, be able to sell attributes in a way that you haven't been able to do before and then have payment assurance because that's also a very big issue right now. We've already seen some of those middle guys getting caught up in that, and that's certainly a challenge. And so I would encourage you while you're here, please stop by our booth, visit with Hannah Weibelhaus, who's here, and Jim Heckman, and then myself, and certainly more than glad to uh, talk with you about that. And with that, I would be glad to answer any questions or address any comments there might be. So great question. The question is, uh, to repeat it, is, is China, there's, there's, we're reading about China and the International Monetary Fund, and are they going to be coming in and become actually a, a key currency uh, across the world? And then, therefore, what happens is the U.S. dollar gets benchmarked against uh, the Chinese yuan. Yes, it looks like that's actually going to happen. Um, there's certainly some indication of that. That has, I think, some important implications to the world and, and obviously to the United States in terms of what happens to our dollar because they begin to move in concert with one another. Um, for me personally, that's a little concerning. One always wonders about what happens, the information that comes out of China. I hope I'm, if, if I hope you did, it's okay, I comment a little bit about it. It's a, um, and then you always wonder, you know, what, what's really going on in terms of their economy and, and the value of their dollar truly there relative to ours. But um, uh, it looks like there's probably no turning back. But again, I think it's one of those things that's very important for us to watch um, as we talk about fiscal policy and then also the value of our dollar relative to other dollars because the export market is so important to us. So, so important. So... I think it's a good question. You know, I can't include everything, but it's the question is about drop value, hide and off all value, 
and it's gone down dramatically in just the last year. It's, you almost can tie that directly to the strength of the dollar, right? We, we export those things. We, we, you know, we're very fortunate that other countries like variety meats, and they also like our hides. But um, as, as the strength of the dollar goes up, the relative attractiveness of our exports, especially those things that make a difference, and especially to a packer, boy, that can be their margin, those become more competitive. And so I would say to that, you just have to watch the dollar. I mean, you almost can peg that perfectly to the dollar, much like you can do um, trimmings, 90% trim. As the dollar gets stronger, guess what we're going to do? We're going to buy trim. We've been buying trim like crazy from New Zealand and Australia. Just bring it, okay, because it's cheaper. And it's, if you turn yourself back to your Econ 101 class, right, that's our, our, rel our comparative advantage. It's cheaper for them to do it than it is for us. So that's, that's where we go with that. Yep, great question. But it's, it's, it's part of the same story that we're talking about right here with China, right? It's, it's the dollar, what have you, and where do we go? And, and um, you know, it's very important to watch is, is we watch these oil prices because that's also going to contribute to where our dollar goes and currency values and, yeah. Uh, you're not supposed to ask the hard questions. That's, I don't. I think you're referring to this slide specifically. Yeah. I don't think it's going to be instantaneous, right? I mean, ultimately, I, I just think being an old guy, I, I like trends. And I think our business still is big enough that it's going to want to work its way back to that trend. Um, we're still relatively limited on supply in terms of cattle numbers, so there's still going to be some drive to buy feeder cattle, what have you. But I think probably that curve begins to change direction back the other way. I think it's going to have to. Because feed yards can't continue to experience the kinds of losses that they are. Because ultimately what's going to happen is they, they're losing liquidity. They just don't buy feeder cattle. And um, so ultimately that has to go back. And I just think in, if you look at any kind of fairly segmented business, and obviously ours is as segmented and fragmented as any, and that's part of what makes it so fun but also so challenging, typically those kind of big swings from sector to sector just don't, aren't sustainable long term. And, and again, I, with this I want to be really careful. I'm not trying to say that a feed yard's finances are similar to a cow calf operation. I'm not saying that at all. And I don't know if these numbers per se mean anything exactly, but I do know the trend is way out of whack. And that's partly what's contributing to what we see happening in the feed yard and how much risk they were at when they were buying feeder cattle and ultimately that's going to have to change directions. Now nothing ever unwinds quickly in this business so it probably takes several years but my guess is we're going to probably turn that back and level off somewhere closer to the mean.